there and welcome to the Explaining History podcast and today I want to talk a little bit about the expulsion of ethnic Germans at the end of the Second World War, uh, really from about 1944 onwards, um, as the, firstly as the fortunes of the Third Reich uh, decline uh, at the end of the war and then um, in the uh, post-war period of establishment of um, new national and communist regimes uh, in the east and also um, in the in central Europe, um, a, a more state-led and official expulsion of ethnic Germans took place. But the place to start really is um, in nineteen the period nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty one where Hitler and Stalin, uh, under the auspices of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, actually arranged for um, population transfers of Soviet citizens who had come under the aegis of the Nazis and German citizens, who, or German nationals, or ethnic Germans, who had been um, um, Soviet citizens. Uh, these populations were, were transferred. Uh, under this agreement, but before we go there, I want to just discuss part of the re- part of my reasoning for talking about this today, and that it's one of the stories about the Second World War that really is is extremely inconvenient um, and doesn't easily fit into the um, the conventional narratives of, of the war. That obviously the um, Nazis are the prime perpetrators of human rights abuses and ethnic cleansing and genocide to entertain the idea that at the end of the war there are indeed German victims um, of the war and that the war is on some level and its aftermath and the even up until into the 1950s that there are repercussions for uh, German people uh, and that the war from at least from a German point of view, can be seen as a German tragedy, is in um, the West particularly um, a very uh, unpopular way of of, of thinking of things. Um, however, when you look at the statistics, about 12 million people uh, between 1944 and about 1950 are expelled from Eastern Europe back to um, Germany and some to Australia, some to um, America and uh, other parts of the world, some to South America. Uh, and statistics for the civilian deaths um, involved in that transfer of people range between a conservative 600,000 to a quite widely accepted figure of 2 million. Then you're starting to look at um, a, a tragedy on an enormous scale. Um, a great many of those who who died in these transfers had very little to do with the, the crimes of the Nazi regime. And as is often the way uh, in these um, hugely traumatic uh, movements of peoples and that peoples, um, a significant proportion of, the, of fatalities are children. It's interesting, of course, that um, this process happened at the same time as the much widely, much more widely known, widely understood um, uh, ethnic ethnic uh, catastrophe of the partition of India, Um, and yet, um, arguably, um, the uh, fate of the um, ethnic Germans uh, being expelled from Eastern Europe has gone. Um, at least outside of Germany, largely uh, unexplored. So it was the um, Soviet Germans, uh, particularly those that lived in the Baltic states and some from the Crimea, who, when um, handed over by um, Stalin, were divided by the Nazis into three classifications. The Altreich, the Sonderfall and the Ostfalle. Um, The first two categories, Altreich and Sonderfall, were um, hugely um, uh, suspect as far as the Nazi racial authorities went. These were Germans who had probably a bit of Polish blood, probably um, a bit of Slavic blood in them, possibly even some Jewish blood. And they were kept in racial internment camps for observation and uh, study and analysis 
by um, Nazi eugenicists and um, the uh, and racial scientists. Um, I use the term scientist there in, in the kind of loosest possible sense, obviously. Um, the um, I think racial hygienist is in fact the term that the the Nazis used because they were saying you know that the um, the body of Germany as a whole, as a, a believe you know as an organic entity, needed to be hygienically protected from these these kinds of um, alien influences. Um, it was the, the Ostfahler who were considered to be the the good stock, those that were racially pure, and they were resettled in the um, um, the Wartegau and East Prussia, and some in the general government uh, of occupied er areas of of Poland, um, and the, the these um, were examples of what Hitler referred to as the, the Volksdeutsch, um, the uh, you know national Germans. Uh, and these were going to be the colonists, the settlers, the pioneers um, who were going to um, racially reorder uh, Eastern Europe. And these are uh, many, the, many of the Germans who are expelled from Poland uh, at the end of the war. When they were actually um, sent to post-war Germany um, into either the Soviet-occupied or, more likely, the Western sectors, for many of these um, Baltic Germans or even Crimean Germans, um, this would have actually been, at the end of the war, the first time that they had really, for any reasonable period of time, experienced the, the, the country, supposedly, of, of their origin. The beginnings of the Great German Exodus start in about 1944, when it's clear that the uh, German army cannot withstand the Red Army on, on the Eastern Front, and the newly occupied parts of um, Poland uh, that have been uh, dominated by um, the Volksdeutsch, the um, Ostfala, uh, and also... Uh, the German communities that have existed for centuries in parts of Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania and beyond, uh, these communities all begin to become extremely apprehensive and terrified even of uh, the prospect of being caught by the Red Army. The amount of devastation done by Germany in the Soviet Union and calculated conservatively at 27 million uh, uh, deaths by 1945, the um, Germans are, are well, uh, well aware um, of what they have done in the Soviet Union and have no intention of being caught by the Red Army. So there is, firstly, a, a voluntary exodus of uh, people fleeing westwards, but this flight becomes very uh, contentious in the, the last year of the war. There are um, various plans for evacuation drawn up, but um, Hitler and the uh, senior Nazis um, around him all believe that this represents a, a defeatism and the um, uh, permission to um, uh, evacuate uh, millions of ethnic Germans from the front line shows some kind of cowardice, and there is a fear amongst the um, Nazi leadership, who are completely divorced from reality for the most part at this point, that this sense of defeatism and flight will infect the, the Reich itself, and people will simply give up fighting. And one of the um, um, principles that Hitler bases the final couple of years of the Reich on is that you know the, the country will go down in flames and they will have to fight to, an end, to the end. For more on this particular topic of why Germany fights to the end, get The End by Ian Kershaw um, because there's an interesting dynamic here of how the, um, the German people really are kind of tied into the regime almost inescapably uh, after 1944, after the bomb plot against Hitler fails. But that's a slightly different story, um, but get that book, because it really is hugely important on this topic. During the winter of 1944-45, the uh, refugee trains uh, are frequently overrun by the Soviets, and so uh, long, long columns of civilians are strafed by aircraft, and 
uh, attacked by tanks, and there are all manner of, um, of atrocities perpetrated uh, against them. And the um, the Soviets do this largely with impunity. There's very little comeback for any soldiers uh, in the Red Army who are uh, convicted of crimes against civilians. The next stage in the story of the expulsions happens at the Potsdam Conference following Germany's defeat. And it was at Potsdam that the borders of the new Germany are decided, the division of the new Germany is decided, and the expulsion of ethnic Germans from Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Poland is decided. Um, the official language of the conference was that uh, the three governments, having considered the question in all its aspects, recognised that the transfer to Germany of German populations or elements thereof remaining in Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary will have to be undertaken. They agree that any transfers that take place should be effected in an orderly and humane manner. Well, orderly and humane really aren't what uh, occurs and unfolds. The reason for um, the Allied governments agreeing to this kind of large-scale movement of populations is firstly because uh, the war has seen such huge uh, population transfers and such um, huge ethnic violence anyway, that um, and this huge degree of, of brutalization, that one more act really seems um, kind of proportionate. Secondly, the um, movement of populations of uh, national ethnic populations into um, nation states based on ethnicity was part of the thing that was really begun um, at the Paris Peace Conference with um, Wilson's ideas of self determination. And many of the pe many of the post-war planners saw the causes of the Second World War in Europe, particularly as being related to the failure of that process. So finally, getting um, Poles where Poles should be, Germans where Germans should be, Czechs where Czechs should be, um, was considered to be part of the um, the brutal answer to uh, preventing a, a further war. The expulsion of Germans from Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary um, resulted also in the, the confiscation of a, a great deal of their wealth. And it kind of happens at the same time that the Soviet Union is doing its own um, ethnic cleansing. The Soviet Union uh, is granted um, the uh, eastern portions of Poland that it was given in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement. Um, is ironic that the um, Allies at um, the Potsdam Agreement wind up honouring um, the Nazi-Soviet pact to some extent. And the, as the two million Poles that are expelled from um, the, that, that part of Poland arrive in the new Poland, which incorporates um, parts of uh, eastern Prussia, so Germans are expelled to make room for them. In Czechoslovakia, um, a, with a smaller population and a much higher um, ethnic German population, the situation is uh, more stark. Um, the, a fifth of the population is German. That comes to nearly four million ethnic Germans uh, who uh, had traditionally looked upon the Czech provinces of Czechoslovakia as being part of, part of Germany. The Czech government in exile during the Second World War had begun to discuss what it viewed as the German problem and had begun to uh, explicitly um, insist on the, the removal of all Germans from Czech territory at the end of the war, um, partly as a result of the Lidice massacre and the various reprisals that were instituted by the Nazis for the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich in 1942. So um, there is a, a long history of state-orchestrated um, ethnic uh, cleansing that goes back not to 1944, but to about 1942 in regard to, to the Czechs. It might have been realistic for the Czech government to suggest that Germans and Czechs were unlikely to be able to peaceably live side by side at the end of the Second World War, however... The situation begins to sort of reverse itself after 1948 with the communist takeover and the um, suspicion that there was a, a brain drain 
um, from the east to the west. Uh, and after 1948, um, a certain per per percentage of the Sudeten German population is actually required to remain in Czechoslovakia, even if they wish to leave. Um, the reason, obviously, being that um, the Sudeten Germans were quite renowned for their manufacturing and engineering know-how and expertise, and these were all going to be assets to the new Czech economy. Um, the Soviets were really in Hungary, the people who decided what the fate of um, Hungary's German populations would be. And the decision to expel Hunga um, Hungarian Germans um, was um, really dictated by, by the Red Army. And it wasn't just countries in the East that um, decided to expel their German citizens. 25,000 German citizens um, were uh, forced to leave the Netherlands in 1946 um, as uh, unwanted foreign nationals, even those who had married in the Netherlands and who had uh, Dutch spouses. Um, the, there was a policy instituted by Stalin of, have, of forcing uh, Germans, uh, German civilians to work as uh, labour in the Soviet Union at the end of the Second World War. Many of these were um, German citizens, um, the Volksdeutsch, who were kind of overrun by the Red Army and caught um, and then were, were um, shipped from Poland to the USSR in 1945-1946, and about 155,000 of them were taken. They were referred to by the Soviets as rep uh, reparations labour. Some figures actually put the um, number of Germans um, taken hostage in the USSR as close to 200,000, and figures of between anything between about 50 and 70,000 are widely quoted as the number of those who died um, largely as a result of uh, cold disease and slave labour. If you consider as well that um, Romania and Yugoslavia also expelled their um, German citizens uh, and uh, German colonists, the uh, problems that this presented to the military authorities in Western Europe at the end of the Second World War in terms of dealing with moving around displaced peoples was enormous, and I think this is, was no small source of satisfaction to the Soviets, who quite enjoyed uh, seeing the chaos this caused uh, British and American uh, and other allied uh, uh, displaced services and people services and the Red Cross. It was um, only in the 1950s and then later on in the 60s and 70s that there was a real um, governmental and scholarly research into the scale of the expulsions and the fates really of the people involved. And the the figures, again, range from about um, half a million to three quarters of a million deaths. And as with all these things, it depends on the study you're looking at. Um, there is still, with the, um, uh, the Jewish Holocaust, still some area for debate about precisely how many people were, were murdered and other ma major demographic events and catastrophes such as um, the um, the Great Chinese Famine of the late 50s, early 60s, uh, the debate is still raging as to how many people actually died. It's, it's very difficult to ascertain the, these kinds of figures. Um, so part of the part of the reason for exploring this, as I say, is that it give, it is very rarely uh, included in the historical memory of the Second World War. It's very much a, a kind of a footnote. And yet it's such a major demographic transformation. And it means that the um, nations of post-war um, Eastern Europe are, for the first time, very much kind of uh, ethnically concentrated. The um, uh, Poles... Czechs, Hungarians, Romanians are very are, are far more kind of 
um, far less ethnically diverse uh, as nations as, as they once were, again, which has um, important implications for the nature of those nations under the, the dynamics of the Cold War, which is something hopefully we'll, we'll look at, at at another time. And it also raises questions about um, the, the idea of the good war. Um, there's a very interesting article in The Guardian um, in January by Geoffrey Wheatcroft. It's well worth Googling if you can find it. I can't find the link at the moment, but I'll, I'll see what I can do um, about this distinction between, um, in, in terms of sort of British kind of historiographies, of the First World War being the bad war and the Second World War being the good one, i.e. in the First World War we kind of resort to a different mistake. We don't know what we're fighting for. But in the Second World War, at least there's a cause, there's a bad guy. The only problem with the analysis of the Second World War as the good war is that the majority of casualties, the majority of deaths in the Second World War are endured by civilians and the majority of obviously deaths in the First World War are um, active combatants. Perhaps uh, not, not ideal either, but certainly um, uh, it gives the Second World War less of a kind of... Um, Less justification to be referred to as a, as a good anything, particularly. And at the end of the war, obviously, the, the losing side um, tends to incur a, a high degree of those casualties. In Germany's terms, the great, great expulsions. And, of course, the city, the aerial bombing uh, carried out by the British and the Americans throughout the war and the devastation caused by the Red Army all left Germany with this profound sense in the 50s and 60s that it had um, endured a, a terrible tragedy, um, which meant, of course, that during the post-war era, the question of Germany and the Jews uh, and the uh, responsibility and the culpability of um, ordinary Germans to the fate of the Jews gets obscured while, the, uh, while, while many ordinary Germans look upon the tragedy that has um, unfolded um, the uh, Aryan German people. Anyway, I hope you found that useful and interesting, and um, if you want more on uh, this kind of thing, you need to get Julia Routledge's very, very brilliant The Genocidal Century. Um, you can get it on my website at www.explaininghistory.com, and I'll post a link underneath this podcast. Look forward to catching you on the next Explaining History podcast. Thanks. Bye-bye.